On today's show, the Hawks fall victim to a shooting barrage from the Celtics in a 25-point home loss on this Wednesday evening. We'll get into all of what transpired, including the Hawks' own struggles for three-point range, Boston letting it up, as well as all the ins and outs of what transpired in this game. We'll get into all of that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1350 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you deep into the night here on a Wednesday evening into Thursday morning. And today's episode is myself breaking down what became a pretty nasty loss for the Hawks. A home blowout, down by as many as 31 points in the fourth quarter, losing by 25 to the Celtics. Granted, Boston was the best team in the league record-wise coming in, the best offense in the league as well. But still, nobody really anticipated this, especially with more, some injuries to the Celtics coming in the night. And really, by tip-off, it's kind of a coin flip game on paper. But the Hawks were not able to execute throughout this one. They were in the game in the, into the third quarter. They were down by four points at one point in the third quarter. And uh, from there, it got, got off the rails in a hurry for Boston. And the biggest reason was the three-point line. We'll get into that later on in the podcast. But certainly, no one is thrilled by this result. I know that Hawks fans sometimes are not necessarily eager to listen to the podcast as much after a blowout loss. So hopefully, you are joining us on this podcast this evening or this morning. If you're listening to this podcast on Thursday, and we'll get into all the nuance and all the details and the big picture look and the uh, future-facing looks, all that kind of stuff on the podcast. But we do thank you for listening to the show and making us your first listen each and every day. Check us check us out across podcast platforms: Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube. YouTube, all those places, and we'll dive into the game right now. So the Hawks, again, facing a team that was red hot. Boston had won seven in a row, now eight in a row with this victory, and they've been really cooking on offense. We saw that in this game, um, even with some, I will say, some outlier shooting from the Celtics, as we'll probably mention later on in the show as well. Um, that definitely happened, but Boston was number one in the league in offense. They were shooting the heck out of the ball. They were really good across the board, really offensively coming into the night, and that definitely showed in this game. They, they really were strong from the opening tip. Um, injury-wise, though, the Hawks were the healthier team. And I, again, I'm knocking on wood when I say this, but the Hawks have only really had the one injury all year with Bogdanovich, who's still out. And I've been saying this since the summer, that they were going to miss Bogey if he missed time. They definitely do miss him in a big way, but he's been the only guy that's really missed any kind of time for an injury. Trey Young missed one game. Um, I, I call him this one game for personal reasons, but the Hawks have been pretty darn healthy to this point in the season, whereas Boston was missing a bunch of guys in this game. Robert Williams, who's their starting center and their anchor defensively, has been out all year. Uh, Gallinari, of course, our old friend, has not been playing since he tore his ACL over the summer. Um, and then in this game, kind of late in the day, the Hawks ruled out both Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon, who are arguably their two best guards. Obviously, this is a team that's led by its wings with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, as well as its big rotation with guys like Grant Williams and Al Horford and Robert Williams when he's up, when he's healthy and available. But Marcus Smart's a great player, defensive player of the year last year. Um, obviously, Malcolm Brogdon is a local product from Georgia, a good player as well. Those guys were out in this game. That, that left the Celtics without their top two guards and their best center. So that's kind of an interesting situation, especially when the Hawks are at home in this spot. And with all that said, Boston was favored by like two and a half, three points in the morning. But once they ruled out Smart and Brogdon, it was essentially a pick em, according to our friends at Ben Online, by tip-off. And that kind of felt right to me. You know, Boston's the better team, I would say, overall. And that's been reflected in the numbers so far. But that includes all of their guys, or at least most of their guys, being healthy, whereas they were down two huge pieces. They were playing on the road, plus Williams plus Gallo, et cetera, but the Hawks just kind of never found their footing in this one. So we'll get into the game now, as expected, but uh, it's one of those things where uh, not a whole lot went well for Atlanta, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of try to coat that along the way here. So uh, it was DeJounte Murray first on Jalen Brown, and then they played DeAndre Hunter on Jason Tatum with the Celtics playing without guards. They've been doing this a lot recently anyway, but they were playing Brown at the two and Tatum at the three. So they're pretty big at those spots. That kind of forced the Hawks to have Murray covering one of them, which is going to be Brown in that, in, that, in that instance. But neither team actually got off to a flying start. As much as Boston was really good shooting in this game, they only the two teams only, only had 10 points combined the first like three and a half minutes of the game. They had the, the first push was Boston. They actually scored nine points in a five-possession stretch to take a six-point lead. There was a brilliant block shot by John Collins on a Derek White dunk attempt that kind of stopped the offensive run from Boston at that point in time. He also tied up Jalen Brown a few minutes later. Um, defensively but even with that mini run like nobody was actually scoring the Hawks were not able to generate offense and honestly if you ask me at halftime even what the story of the game was going to be it might have been three-point shooting for sure 
but it was the Hawks offense. They, they, they really couldn't score for a large portion of this game. Uh, ended up being, you know, if you were kind of catching up at the end, you would have probably focused on the defense and, the, and the, sort of the inability to, to stop the Celtics. But for a lot of this game, it was the offense that was really kind of far behind the defense for the Hawks. Um, Boston switches a lot defensively, which I don't want to make too much of that. It's not like it's not that simple. Uh, and obviously the Hawks have been playing the Bucks quite a bit recently, and they've been awesome defensively this year. But Boston's system and the way they defend definitely flummoxes the Hawks a little bit more. It's more like what Miami does than what, what than more like Milwaukee does. And obviously we've seen the Hawks kind of struggle against that. That happened in this game as well to some degree. Uh, Boston executes very well. They're very well-disciplined and well-coached defensively. That, 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 that definitely showed. The Hawks ran the ball over a few times in the early going. Uh, there was one that uh, DeAndre Hunter tried to dunk pretty loudly and ended up missing that and kind of having it go out of bounds for a turnover. Um, anyway, that was kind of uh, sort of the broad strokes early on. But rotationally, it was pretty similar to what's been happening for the Hawks recently. Aaron Holiday and Okongwu as the first subs for Clint Capella and Trey Young. Then AJ Griffin came back in. He was uh, in the rotation again in this spot. No surprise, but obviously a positive if you are in the, on that uh, sort, sort of side of the opinion there for the AJ should be playing as I am at this point. Uh, Capella came back in as he usually does, along with Jalen Johnson. And the only real tweak is that Aaron Holiday had a quicker stint. Actually, came out a little bit earlier. They brought. Hunter back in to kind of match with Tatum, it seemed like, which is uh, something that I would probably look to do as well. But the first half rotation was very normal. Um, but it's kind of weird, though. Boston, with their injuries, was playing a front court of Sam Hauser, Blake Griffin, and Luke Cornett at one point, which is a crazy on paper front court in an NBA game right now. But Hauser is a great shooter. Cornette's a really good shooter for a center. Griffin didn't play that much this game. That was kind of that one thing I wanted to be circled to kind of say, like maybe maybe Boston's vulnerable in this game. They, they actually weren't, of course, at this point. But traditionally, it did, it did change in the second half, as we'll get into later on. They kind of, uh, what, whether they wanted to just like stoke the offense or whatever, they kind of pulled Aaron Holiday and went, went back to Justin Holiday in the second half at one point. But I kind of thought in the first half that was going to be mostly – the end of Justin Holiday rotation experience because um, if he wasn't going to play in this matchup against Boston against a team that has big wings, I thought it might be more indicative of what was going on. Of course, he he later played, so we'll see. But uh, I and as as I said on the, on the show before the game, I would have probably tried just a little bit more in this game. Nothing would have stopped anything. You know, I thought Aaron struggled pretty badly in this game, but no matter what, like. Boston just made everything <laughs> across the board. Um, and again, the offense couldn't get it going for the Hawks. They only had four points in like a five and a half minute stretch in the first quarter. They had 14 points in the first 22 possessions to be down by 13 points at that point. Trey did throw one of his trademark, just preposterous passes on a kick out to AJ Griffin around two defenders. AJ missed the shot. So I probably, probably won't make the sports center or anything like, anything like that, but uh, another great pass from Trey as he does pretty much nightly. And there was a pretty insane sequence at the end of the first quarter where both teams were like playing volleyball and like tossing the ball around, kicking the ball around, and it was scrambling and diving and jumping and just total chaos for a while. I'm not sure what happened there, but it was a pretty funny, entertaining sequence, like yakety sacks kind of stuff. But the Hawks, the Hawks were down by 12 points at the end of the first quarter, and the big theme again was that they only had 18 points in the first quarter and like a 65 offensive rating in the quarter. They were 8 of 24 from the floor, 0 of 6 from three. They were 5 of 19 on shots away from the rim. They just could not make a jumper in the first quarter, and that kind of carried over to the rest of the game. They had some uh, defensive issues and kind of losing Sam Hauser a couple times. Those never stopped, honestly. They actually got worse as the, as the night went on, but uh, I thought that was at least kind of notable at that point. Um, you know, second quarter, kind of more of the same. It was a little bit better for Atlanta. They actually got their offense going. It was their best quarter of the game because the offense was actually kind of firing. It was the Murray plus bench unit early in the second quarter, and Boston took the lead uh, by 16 points, actually. Hunter had a good stretch of offense where he actually made uh, his the first three of the night for the Hawks overall. Um, he actually had a pretty bad moment, though. They got captured and kind of memed on the internet where he kind of failed to beat Luke Cornette off the dribble and got a shot blocked. It might have been a foul by Cornette, but still not a great sign that he's not just like blowing by Luke Cornette in space. But Hunter did have a nice finish and transition moments later, so it kind of made it for that a little bit more. Offensively, just on both sides, went way up in the second quarter. It was 20 to 20 in like six and a half minutes in that period. Hoss got back within nine and then got back within seven again. When Capella came back in and kind of lead a little mini run once once again, there was a pretty notable swing, I thought, actually late in the first half. Maybe less notable now that they actually got blown out in the game. But Murray got called for a pretty bad charge in transition that would have been at least a chance to get to the line and cut the, cut the lead down to five if he made the free throws. Nate seemed to be considering a challenge, never actually did. I'm not sure if he would have won it. I thought it was a bad call in the moment, but you know, block charges are tough for sure. And then Boston hit a three right away. And so suddenly it was like, could have been five and it was back to 10. Now the Hawks got it down to six again with Trey Young in the final seconds. And then Peyton Pritchard 
kind of uh, in a microcosm of the night. Um, Aaron Holiday was pressing up on him in the backcourt with three seconds to go, which is a little bit of a curious decision, to be sure. Um, he was very aggressive. Pritchard managed to shed him, get the ball going full speed down the floor, hit a pretty calm pull-up three to go up by nine again. And that was uh, Boston making shots, the Hawks not executing well, all wrapped up in one, and Atlanta goes into the halftime break down by nine points. They did find the offense, though, in the second quarter. It was better there than it had been previously. They shot well from two in the first half, but 58% from two-point range. Didn't turn the ball over the entire game. The three-point shooting was definitely a problem throughout. Trey struggled in the first half as well. And then defensively, it wasn't a disaster, I will say. Boston just took a lot more threes and made a lot more threes, and that was a, definitely the theme of the night. And they had 16 assists in that first half. Um, we'll get into the second half, of course, and sort of the overall takeaways from this one. But uh, let's just say it didn't get any better. Portland, and actually got worse after halftime, and we'll get into that momentarily. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by BetterHelp, and unfortunately, life does not come with a user manual, so it's not working out as planned. It's totally normal, normal to feel actually stuck, and navigating any of life's challenges can make you unsure of things, whether it's a change in your career, a new relationship, becoming a parent, or something totally different from all of those things. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn skills that are productive in coping with what's happening in your life. That makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine that you actually are. BetterHelp can bring self-empowerment and help you deal with the challenges of life, whether it's trauma or simply feeling overwhelmed. And as the world's largest therapy service, both BetterHelp has matched more than 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable for you. Fill out a brief quick questionnaire to match with the therapist. And if things start clicking, you can easily switch that to a new therapist at any point. It cannot be any simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no one searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off on your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. That is betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on MBA. All right, in the second half, kind of amusingly, Murray hit a three for the Hawks in the first possession of the of the half after Atlanta was so brutal at three-point line and Boston had been so good the entire game. The Hawks scored the first five points overall in the third quarter and they cut the lead to four. It was 62-58 in favor of Boston. And at that point, it felt like a game. It was definitely uh, the Hawks were in it. They were scrapping. Jalen Brown got his fourth foul quickly in the third quarter. Had to come out of the game. The door kind of felt very open for Atlanta. But then, of course, Boston made a couple of threes right away, back to 10, and it never got competitive really again the rest of the way. In fact, it didn't stop there. A 23-7 overall run by the Celtics to go by 20, 16 minutes left in the uh, in the game. A lot went poorly in that run. Boston kept making threes. They were mostly open, but even the even the ones that were contested were going in. That's something Nate McMillan said after the game as well. Like They made open ones and contested shots, which I agree with. And, the, and then the Hawks just couldn't make a shot in the third quarter. They were 6 of 18 from the floor in the first eight minutes of the second half with no free throw attempts. And if you're not going to make threes, you got to get to the line. And the Hawks did not in this game. Um, there was one, uh, probably, I don't, I don't mean to pick on him, but there was one like notably bad shot that uh, those of us on press row were kind of observing as a pretty crazy attempt. Aaron Holliday took this like 15-foot mid-range fadeaway that no one could believe that he took. And I don't think Nate could either because right after that, Aaron got pulled for Justin Holiday, his brother, of course, who had not played the entire game at that point. And Aaron never returned. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was the only reason why. Maybe it was because of the blowout. Um, and there was other reasons. You know, the Hawks ended up going kind of small um, at that point, as Nate often does to kind of juice the offense. They went back to Collins at the five. They were playing uh, They were playing Justin. And, and Jalen Johnson didn't play in the rotation in the second half. But uh, that was an interesting kind of just test case because Aaron took a very, very bad shot, came out, never came back in. Anyway, uh, there was one huge dunk from John Collins in the third quarter that would probably make the roundups that you probably see highlight wise today, tonight, and tomorrow. But, and the Hawks got back to 15 at one point, very briefly. Boston finally had a couple empty trips on offense. Justin Holiday had a huge block, but another microcosm of the night was that Holiday comes from, from the weak side, blocks it, and the ball caroms right to Sam Hauser in the corner for an open three. He makes it, and that was one of those moments that kind of just burn you. And it's like especially tough to have that when you're already struggling defensively and you finally make a nice play at the rim and it still leads to a three. It's like kind of backbreaking for the Hawks. And they were down by 19 at the end of the third quarter. Trey had a better third quarter, I will say, offensively. He had 12 points, but the Hawks only shot 38% from the floor in the period. The Celtics had 38 points and seven threes in the third quarter alone. And through three quarters, Boston had 18 threes. Now that's like on pace for like league record kind of stuff. And the Hawks were 5 of 23. In fact, the Hawks had five threes in the competitive portion of the game. They, they made two in garbage time to get to seven for the night, but uh, it was really, really rough. And offensively, their Hawks were also struggling by their own standards. Now, not, not much to say about the fourth quarter. Honestly, in a hurry, it was 22 from Boston. Uh, Nate tried to bring 
Trey and John Collins back a little bit earlier than usual, trying to make a run, I guess probably like one final run at it because they play Collins at the five. Trey sat for a shorter period of time than he usually does in the fourth quarter. But they started scoring a little bit better, but they gave a lot back on the defensive end of the floor as that's kind of the risk of that unit. And then the white flag was waved with about five and a half minutes to go in the fourth. And that came after a 55 to 30 extended run by the Celtics from down four to down 29 over that stretch. It was like over about, about a quarter and a half almost of time, but they got just walloped for about, you know, 16, 17 minutes of clock time. And when they were, at that point in time, they went down, they were down 29, cleared the bench. Jared Culver was inactive because with only bogey out, the Hawks have to actually choose an act, an active player every time that they had everybody with them. So it was a closing lineup of Trent Forrest, Tyrese Martin, Vic Krejci, Jalen Johnson, and Frank Kaminsky. The Hawks were down by as many as 31 points, and uh, they lost by 25. Again, they made two threes on the stretch to kind of make it look a little, a little bit better. But this is really more of a 30-point loss than it was a 25-point loss, even though that's kind of a small distinction to make at this point. Um, as for the numbers, they're pretty ugly. I, I pulled the per-possession numbers before garbage time actually started. When the Hawks pulled their starters, they had a 127 defensive rating. That's very, very bad. Now, Boston does have a 119 offensive rating for the season, so it's not like it's that much worse than that. But at that point, Boston uh, – sorry, this is actually the full game number. Uh, Boston was 21 of 46 from three-point range, so 46% on huge volume. Uh, it's hard to beat a team when they do that. That goes without saying. There's some make-or-miss league stuff in this result. I'm not going to try to tell you that's all of it by any means, but – Anytime a team makes shots like Boston did in this game, whether you're defending them well or not, it is hard to go ahead and go by that. The crazier part of this is that, objectively speaking, Boston's two best players are Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, right? Jason Tatum's an MVP candidate this year, for instance, so far. Those two guys combined to shoot four of 16 from three. The rest of the team was 17 of 30 from three. Uh, Boston has a, lot of, has a lot of good shooters. That's one thing I, that I will say, and you know, I try to say this on Twitter as well. Boston just has better shooters than the Hawks do. That doesn't mean they have better talent overall, but they have better shooters than the Hawks do. Sam Hauser is a knockdown shooter. Peyton Pritchard is a really good shooter. Luke Cornett for a center is a great shooter for that position. Uh, obviously Tatum and Brown, um, but, you know, Grant Williams is a really good shooter as well. So the, like Al Horford for a center, good shooter, etc. So they don't have a lot of like non-shooters, especially um, maybe Derek White's the closest thing, and even he, he's capable of making a shot. So that's part of this, but the Hawks also did, also did a very poor job at the point of attack in this game. The closeouts are really short uh, at times. And once Boston got going, they made they made some tough ones too, but I thought the point of attack defense guys, like you know, even Murray was below average for him. Trey was pretty bad defensively in this game. Aaron Holiday was really bad in this game defensively. I didn't think that it was the best effort for A.J. Griffin in his minutes either. Hunter had his uh, negative moments along the way as well. Basically, everyone on the perimeter had a rough game, and I think even the back line, like Capella was – his normal self for the most part. Akongu was below average for him. Collins had some nice moments, but that was uh, it wasn't like it was his best game either. It was just rough across the board. So it, kind of a perfect storm of a good team making a ton of shots and not defending very well on top of all of that. Now, the Hawks did four 15 turnovers, which is pretty good. They held them to 10 free throw attempts. That's, that's also pretty good. And they rebounded the ball quite well. So there were some positives. And really, if you look at like the four factors breakdown of this game, it's really Boston just making shots like crazy. But anyway, that kind of all matters. And if, you, if there's one thing you want to circle in the four factors, it's the actual shooting numbers. Cause that's, that's kind of what, what can break you. And that happened in this game um, on offense. It was a 98 offensive rating before they emptied the bench. It got up to like 102 for the game, but it was worse than that before garbage time. The Hawks actually shot pretty decently on twos, 52% for the game. There were seven of 32 from three and two of those seven threes were in garbage time. So they made five threes in the first, I don't know, 44 minutes of the game. That's just not enough. Now, they took a little bit more as the game went along, but you know, the, lots of talk about that after the game, uh, both from fans, of course, and even from Nate McMillan and Trey Young, and everyone kind of knows the deal. They're not making shots. And Nate said, you know, you got, you got to take them. You got to let them fly. I agree with that. The Hawks cannot, get sta- cannot, cannot afford to get scared of taking threes. You know, most of these guys won't get scared, but the, the volume's got to be higher. I know I've I'm, I'm say, been saying it quite a few times. In this game, like, you don't see a more make or miss league kind of game than it is than it was tonight. The Hawks were outscored by 42 points for three point range. Like, what are you supposed to do with that? It's, you know, part of that's the temps. They took 14 more threes, but you know, basically what, in fact, exactly what it was at the end of the game. It was as if the Hawks took their current number of seven to seven thirty two 
took 14 more threes and made all 14 of them. That that's Boston three point rate, three, three point percentage in the game. So I don't know. It was a, a bit of a mess on offense across the board. Um, only 13 free throws attempts as well. That's not enough. And I know I said this before, but one of the things that you can do to trade off if you don't take a lot of threes is to get to the rim a lot and get a lot of free throw attempts. The Hawks only taking, I will say, 32 attempts is pretty decent, but in a game where they were trailing the entire game, it makes a lot more sense. But the Hawks didn't take a lot of threes in the normal portion of the game, and then they didn't get to the line. It's a bad recipe. Now, they did win the glass. They did win the turnover battle. And the crazy thing is it wasn't just threes. The Hawks also shot poorly from mid-range in this game. In fact, cleaning the glass, our friends over there, had the Hawks shooting 26 of 78 on all shots outside of the rim. So basically any shot from more than like three and a half, four feet, all the way out to three-point range, they shot 33% on 78 attempts. You are not going to win if that happens, especially when the other team is run hot from three. So, you know, we'll get into the individual breakdown stuff in a second, but uh, this is one of those games where you can kind of you can kind of flush it on one hand because Boston was just so hot. But the Hawks did not play well, full stop. So it's not as simple as saying one team was terrible. The Hawks weren't like, this was not an F minus Hawks performance. Were they good? Absolutely not. But this was, I think they probably, they probably played worse against Charlotte. They probably played worse against Toronto. Um, but we'll see sort of in comparison when they play Toronto again on Saturday for one. But the Hawks did not play well. Boston played very well, shot very well. And when you're playing a team that can that is capable of doing that, and by the way, again, Boston number, number one team in the league right now, it got down, it got the ball got rolling down the hill, let's just say, in a hurry, and the Hawks just could not keep up. And that's one of the that's one of the troubles with not being able to shoot threes at a high level is that if their team is making them, the math problem gets out of hand, and that kind of happened in this game beyond everything else. All right, we'll get into the individual stuff in a second, but first, a sponsor break to hear from our friends and our partners on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Sweat Block, and dealing with sweat is never fun. No matter what the situation might be, nobody wants to sweat at a bad time, whether you're giving a presentation at work or going on a date or just dealing with the heat in Atlanta or elsewhere in the South over the summer. In fact, sweat issues can really hurt your confidence as well. We ought to be confident in what we're doing. And with, with that said, Sweat Block is the way to fix all of those problems. Sweat Block wipes are, were invented by a doctor, and they're actually guaranteed to work or you don't have to pay. They call it the Sweat Block Dry Shirt Guarantee. The sweat block does not keep you dry. You get your money back. If you or someone you love is experiencing the embarrassment of sweat or odor, sweat block is the answer, and you can actually try it risk-free today. Go to sweatblock.com and save 20% if you use the promo code Locked On. Sweat block is also available on Amazon. One more time, that is sweatblock.com, promo code Locked On for 20% off with sweat block. All right, we'll dive in now probably pretty briefly to the player evaluations in this one. Uh, I mentioned the the, four, the five guys who only kind of played very little minutes. It was Kaminsky, Martin, Forrest, and Krejci in the garbage time portion. Justin Holiday only played seven minutes. He played and only the second half, only took one shot, had a block um, and that I mentioned before, but he was just kind of fine. He was out there, pretty quiet stint from him. Um, let's just say I'm going to on the list now, and not a lot of guys played well <laughs> in this game by their standards. Uh, we'll start with Jalen Johnson. He didn't play in the second half until the game was over. Ended up taking a lot of shots. Took 11 shots in 11 minutes because of garbage time. Took four three-point attempts. Um, he was 3 of 11, 0 of 4 from 3. Had four rebounds. Had a steal and a block. Was pretty active, but uh, I think we saw offensively he was more of a liability than a positive in this game, generally speaking. I don't want to make too much of that, but uh, when they were down in the, se- in the second half, I think it was probably the right choice to not go with Jalen because he can't really be that same uh, that sort of like high-leverage shooter that other guys maybe can be, um, and that's uh, at least worth noting for here for, for here and now. I thought um, Aaron Holiday was quite bad in this game. 11 minutes for Aaron. He was minus 19 in those minutes. Um, did have two points, two rebounds, one of six from the floor, 0 of one from from three. And even defensively, like that's Aaron Holiday's claim to fame as a player. Is as he's a pesky on ball defender. He was not stopping anyone and not keeping anyone in front of him in this game. It's a one off. I'm not going to like say that Aaron Holiday is bad now. Like, it's not a panic situation. But um, you know, the one thing that he does, they didn't do very well, and then offensively, he really struggled. I thought in his minutes. Uh, AJ Griffin had a quieter game as well. He actually missed all four three point attempts. Uh, that's another another bad sign for you when you're uh, when your knockdown shooter is 0 of four from three. He was three of five on twos, which is totally fine. Had three rebounds, but they were actually all on offense, which is interesting. Had a steal and an assist. Um, two turnovers. I thought defensively it was his worst game in a while. I thought AJ will actually play like a rookie tonight for the most part. Offensively, he was like under control. He just didn't make shots. That's not a big deal for me because he's going to make shots. I'm not at all worried about that. 
but I think defensively he kind of reverted back a little bit to some bad habits and also just some some times where he kind of fell asleep defensively. Mind you, everyone did, so I'm not picking on AJ, but it was one of those like he's not quite all the way there yet. He's 19 years old. It's okay that he has his moments, but he was not very good in this game. And Akong Wu also struggled, I thought, pretty badly by his standards. He had two points, nine rebounds, five on offense, four on defense, got in some foul trouble early on as he is uh, has a penchant for doing. He did have three assists. That was actually uh, third most on the team. But I thought defensively he was pretty shaky to be kind by his standards. Um, well, and this is usually a good matchup for him. I think in general – Boston, with the way they play, especially without Robert Williams, is a little bit smaller, which usually helps a Kong Wu. And they're a little bit more perimeter focused, which usually helps a Kong Wu, but he just didn't have it in this game. Um, we'll leave that there for now. Um, to the starters, the guy who played the least was Clint Capella. He only played 18 minutes. And I think part, pro- probably most of that was because they were getting blown out. And uh, when they get blown out or they're down a lot, they usually tend to go offense and go small. So what, they never brought Capella back in for that second stint in, this, in the second half because they just didn't need to. But I thought he actually played fairly well when he was out there. Seven points, eight rebounds in 18 minutes, made all three of his shots. Uh, defensively, he was their best player defensively. That's kind of a low bar to clear, but he probably was. Anyway, he was fine. Uh, and one of the uh, very, very small takeaways in a positive sense was that Capella didn't have to – waste minutes like he's obviously an older guy on this roster and being able to manage him a little bit even with two days off is not the worst thing in the world anyway that's kind of where i am on that um hunter had a decent stretch of offense at one point but was pretty inefficient in this one 13 points on 14 shooting possessions four rebounds no assists um the assist thing just continues to be a problem he is not a good passer uh, that's not anything new if you're if you're listening to this podcast or if you're just watching a, watching DeAndre Hunter. But the lack of ball movement and player movement when he is at, at the helm, he takes a lot of those like you know jab step jump shots. I wish he'd let it fly more from three. He took six attempts in this game. That's that's plenty probably for him. But even then, he probably could have taken two or three more catch and shoots. Um, a little bit less of the uh, of the of the of the jab step game would probably be appropriate at times. But uh, and then defensively, he just had no answers either. I will say he did a decent job on Jason Tatum. Um, Tatum was the only guy who didn't really kill them. Even even Brown got going on two point attempts. Tatum was very very modest as a scorer. His facilitation was pretty good in this game, but I thought Hunter was okay on him as a positive, I guess, in this game. Uh, Collins defensively was probably pretty good. Had three blocks, three rebounds, had twelve points. Um, actually made six of nine on twos, but continues to not make, to not make threes. Oh three and. Uh, you know, until he makes shots or until he admits it or something, the finger is going to be a question that I'm getting a lot. He's just not making threes. And right now, it's not really his fault. But the way their Hawks are using him, he has to make jumpers, and he's not making jumpers. And that's really, really tough. His usage is way, way down, which is, you know, part, partly on him, also partly on the team and the way it's all designed. But with the way that they're playing with Murray now in the fold and also always having a center next to him, which they've had for a while, but even then, uh, this year, those guys have been healthy the entire, the entire time. Playing against, uh, playing him with some other guys who are not great shooters, he has to make shots, and he's just not made him, he hasn't made him so far. So I think Collins has been awesome defensively this year, but offensively, he's having his worst season as a pro at this point in time, and part of that is that he's not making threes. So we'll get, we'll get into more of that later on. Uh, the backcourt was at least productive in the numbers. Murray had 19 points on 17 shots, no free throw attempts, five assists. Um, he's never getting in the line. That's kind of the one knock on DeJounte this year. He's been fine. It was, this was definitely a C-minus game for Murray. He wasn't terrible, nor was he great. I think it was bad for him by his standards, again, defensively. At the point of attack, he had some real struggle moments like everybody else did, but he was just okay otherwise. Um, Trey had a shaky first half. Once again, he just cannot make shots for whatever reason right now. Um, he was pretty decent on twos, but again, two of seven from three. So he's just – not finding it right now for whatever reason, but he was better in the second half, 27 points in the game, nine assists, but defensively he was uh, he was a sieve as he sometimes is. And really there was not a lot of positivity to go along in this one. Um, I don't really know if there was a single guy on the roster that I would say played an above average game for their own, um, when compared to their own baseline. Maybe you would say Capella was average. Maybe you would say Murray was close to average, but even then defensively, he probably was probably below average for him. So, uh, Capella was the closest thing I can come up with to a guy who played okay in this game, and that's kind of not where you want to be for the guy who played the least out of all of your core guys because of the uh, margin on the scoreboard. So we'll leave it there for now, but a, a rough one. Now, this is kind of futile to even try at this point, but I will just say it's November 16th as I'm recording this podcast. It's mid-November. It's the it's the 14th game of the season. Sorry, 15th, 15th, 15th game of the season. It's not time for panic. The Hawks have been playing pretty well. They're still 9-6. and six. Was this a good performance? Definitely not. It's a, is it frustrating to lose, especially to, an, to a rival opponent 
at home by 25 points. It's obviously a sort of a panic inducing play. Also, it was on ESPN. Uh, it, was also, it was also on Bally locally. But if people watch on ESPN, that's it's a more high profile. You get more talk around it when the, whenever the team is playing on national TV. So it was a perfect storm of frustration in this one. All of the shortcomings when it comes to perimeter defense. All of the shortcomings when it comes to perimeter shot creation from three point range and actually making shots, etc. It was all kind of coming down at one point in time. So a rough one for sure. I'm not saying otherwise, but also no time to panic at this point. Now the the tough thing is. The Hawks do have two days off. They'll have an off day on Thursday and then a practice on Friday before they play the Toronto Raptors on Saturday. If you are a Hawks fan, you will know this. But as a reminder, the Hawks lost by 30 in Toronto three weeks ago. Now, that was a a perfect storm kind of game, but the Raptors have played the Hawks very well. They're tough to play against. One of the advantages, I think, of this stretch is that the Hawks have a full practice on Friday to actually prepare for Toronto. You know, during the NBA season, it's important to keep in mind that teams are not necessarily game planning quite as much as they would be in the playoff series. It's hard to kind of really put in new things for one for one matchup and then turn around and play another team the next day, et cetera. But they have two days now to prep for Toronto, and I'm sure they want to get that hits out of their mouth from that bad loss in Toronto. So I don't expect them to get blown out again, but that's a real test. The Raptors are a good team. They're well-rested. They, they, they actually played tonight as well, so no rest advantage on either side. And, uh, yeah, nothing's going to be easy about that game for the Hawks. The Raptors play a different style, and they play a lot of tempo, and they put pressure on you, and the Hawks are, have to re- are going to have to respond and play much better than they did on this Wednesday night to get a win on Saturday. But we'll have at least one more podcast between now and then, so stay tuned for all of that. Please subscribe to the show across platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Podbean, also on YouTube on the video side. Please subscribe across any anywhere you like to find podcasts. Let's just say that. And then also please follow us on Twitter at Hawks. Follow me on Twitter if you'd like to at BT Roland. And we'll see you all later on in the week.